All right. So our guest tonight, um, Paul Meisner, is a very, very special person here in our DC Tech community. He's actually been here for uh, a very long time in DC. Uh, he's one of the most probably one of, uh, one of the most influential uh, executives in Amazon. He's been based here. He's the VP of Global Innovation Policy and Communication. Um, Jeff Bezos himself hired him in 1999. And that should just get you excited because I'm sure he has uh, many stories of, of the, the store uh, of the company and where it's, where it's been, what they were thinking, what kind of pivots they made. He's all, he was all there. Uh, and so uh, Paul has basically, um, when he started, uh, he actually uh, founded the, the Global Pub Public Policy Department, which is basically the lobby arm. He was the first lobbyist. Um, and he led the team to serve uh, the company, uh, again, VP of Global Public Policy from February 2000 to May 2016. Um, and because of his work, as you hear, you hear all the other big tech companies like Google, Facebook, um, Apple, they've all followed suit, right, of, of hiring, of getting, uh, uh, you know, a big, you know, lobbyist arm to sort of help policymakers make better decisions for big tech. And... Um, and this is also probably the other reason why Bezos moved the HQ2 closer to the Capitol, right? So his, he, he has huge pre presence, um, and, um, and so we're excited to have him here. Um, I have to mention, because he wanted me to, 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 to talk about uh, things that would make his mom happy. Uh, he is both an engineer, scientist. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree from electrical, uh, electrical engineering and computer science from Princeton, <laughs> right? Full stop, right? Checkbox, right? Your mom would be happy there. Also, on top of that, he was an attorney, right? So he got his JD from JMU um, and had a lot of distinguishing uh, achievement awards and uh, has, has been a member of the bar for DC uh, since 1993. And get this, you know, he is an inventor of three patents. So, uh, so we're excited to have him here. And some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, in our interview, we're going to talk about Amazon.com, AWS, Kindle, Amazon Phone, Alexa, um, Amazon, Amazon Go, uh, Blue Origin, and HQ2. So, welcome, Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna. We always first start out our uh, fireside chat. Um, you know, uh, with you know, from very from the beginning, right? So your personal life. Uh, what, where did you grow up? Uh, where did you go to college? Obviously, you know, went to college, Princeton. Uh, uh, why did you decide to go? and uh, do electrical engineering, CS, uh, and then you know go into law. So let's go first there. Like, where did you grow up? Where, where were you raised? Maybe perhaps what your parents did. So let's do that. Yeah, so thanks, Brian, very much for having me. It's really great to have this opportunity. And I do look forward to the in-person party. I will be there. Uh, so I grew up in this area. So I'm actually a local boy. Uh, I was born in Alexandria Hospital, so you couldn't get more local than that. Uh, and so I spent my entire life living in the DC area. Uh, traveled extensively around the world. I've always traveled for my job. And one of the shocking things about this whole stay at home circumstance that we're going through right now is that I'm just used to being on airplanes and to suddenly not be traveling at all is just is very strange. Um, but I decided I wanted to be an astrophysicist. So I went to Princeton to study astrophysics. And uh, it turns out that I was going to be the one astrophysics major in my year uh, in 1985. And so I decided I wanted something slightly more populated and social. And so I became an electrical engineer, computer science guy, yeah. uh, and then uh, spent some time working for the government. And I was uh, negotiating satellite treaties of all things in my, uh, in my early 20s. And uh, I loved that so much that I figured I, I needed uh, the law overlay on top of, uh, on top of the engineering. Uh, and then just a series of jobs that led me to the very, you know, the, the very lucky meeting that I had with Jeff. I mean, it just, uh, you know, luck plays an outsized role in anybody's career, and uh, to the extent I have ex I've succeeded, much of that was just flat out luck. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, um, I, after a tour of duty, a second tour of duty in the United States government, I went to, to back to my old law firm as a partner. And my role, and this is in uh, the late '90s, my role was to find uh, tech companies that weren't represented in Washington. And so I made a little list, and sure enough, Amazon was at the top of the list. And so I went out to, uh, to see if I could uh, land their business, and they, they hired me. And 
So, but after just a couple of months, they invited me to come in house and went through this interview process. Well, wait, 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 Paul, 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 but there was there was one thing I wanted to to to, to <laughs> because I heard this from a previous interview. But can you tell us like uh, when you got hired, when you got interviewed? You got interviewed by Jeff, right, in 1999. Yeah. And um, you know, I know I, Amazon went public in 1997. Um, I you. You, you said, hey, uh, Jeff told you specifically to look on the TV the, the, the day after. Like, could you tell us like that? <laughs> yeah, it's, look, it's, it's an interesting story, so I, I, I will share it. It's, it's very brief. But basically, his team had me coming out to Seattle to meet with them. And then they called me and said, would you mind going to New York? He's going to be there this weekend. Uh, and I said, sure, that makes it easier on me. So I flew up on a Sunday uh, and sat down with him in his uh, hotel lobby and we just talked for like two and a half hours and really liked each other and and then I'm going to leave I said you know I got to go catch a plane back to Washington and he said oh when you get home tonight turn on CNN and so I did um, and uh, I sat there with my wife and it was Jeff getting Times person of the year right. and that's why he was in New York and so the thought that he had sat down with me for two and a half hours talking about me uh, and it failed to mention that he was Times Person of the Year right. you know, a few hours from now. Right. I just thought this this is a really great guy. Right. And that was 20 years ago, right? I mean, that, and then so much of it happened, you know, since then. So that's amazing. I mean, that's uh, you know, very few people have stories like that. That's kind of like what I I, I wanted you. I want, we everyone wanted to hear stories like this about Jeff. I wanted to also mention like Jeff actually came to my uh, uh, my school at CMU around 98 and, and you know it was funny I, I, I actually didn't get to meet him but uh, uh, but it was funny how a lot of com a lot of my uh, four mates had met him uh, and he was recruiting himself so uh, it just just really uh, so yeah I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off but yeah I thought that was fine sorry um, so so again I uh, before we go to the Amazon because you were about to get to the Amazon story uh, working at Amazon before you were at Amazon, um, you have, uh, I mean, you, you know, I think you had uh, sort of an aspiration to become an astrophysicist engineer. You apparently have a fascination with space and time, in particular, cosmic microwave background radiation. <laughs> like, what the heck is that? Why are you so fascinated with that? Well, because it's the, the, uh, the earliest visible remnant of the Big Bang. So the universe was born uh, 13.7 billion years ago, but it, for its first roughly 380,000 years, it was a plasma, which is when uh, uh, molecules are separated. They, the electrons are not bound to nuclei. And so light does not transverse, it does not traverse rather uh, a plasma. But when it froze out, when it cooled enough so that uh, atoms, individual atoms were actually formed, uh, then all of a sudden there's this burst of light and it was super hot, but over the 13.7 billion years there's been expansion uh, and therefore that super hot radiation has been redshifted down to the, uh, the microwave level. So the cosmic microwave background radiation is this remnant of the Big Bang and it actually has structure, believe it or not, and that structure led eventually to things like galaxies, stars, people. Yeah. So you, you're just, it's, I think that's what's really, really neat about that. You have a fascination of like where we came from, how did the universe start? Uh, and, and, and I think that really resonates with our community because we're, we're, we're a very curious community, right? We're uh, entrepreneurs, engineers, former lawyers, engineers, but we're all about to, you know, uh, you know, create businesses, right? Find the truth. But it's very interesting how, how the way you think is very, it, it resonates with sort of our community. So that's why I wanted to, Kind of talk about that. Well, um, you know, Brian, it, it helps ground you too. If you have a bad week or a bad month or whatever, you got to recognize that it's just such a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of time. And, you know, I, I look at things like Earth Day, and Earth Day is a, a very admirable cause, of course. Environmentalism is super important, obviously. But Earth is going to be fine. Earth is going to be around for another five or six billion years doing just fine. It's really people in life that are. Uh, a much more tenuous situation. And, you know, what's happening right now is uh, just an example of that. So right. it, it keeps you grounded, too. Okay. All right. And um, so right before you went to Amazon, I mean, obviously you worked at FCC, uh, Intel, and then you co-founded the, uh, the Internet Access Coalition. Uh, and then that's when you met Jeff. He brought you in. And so now you have this 20-year, you know, career there. 
And so the first thing I wanted to talk about is because it's top of mind right now, because <laughs> we're all home and we're all, you know, remote, uh, COVID-19. What is Amazon doing right now to sort of uh, to, to manage and fight COVID-19, you know, internally, uh, you know, whether it's the warehouses uh, or, um, you know, the grocery stores. I mean, you guys have such a big footprint. I'm sure you're probably one of the folks to think about, like, what's, what, what, way, what ways and, and, and technology you can use to, to fight this. So I want to kind of open that up. But what are you guys doing? Well, we're doing as much as we can. And it really is true. The leadership of the company all the way up to Jeff is spending all of its brain power on COVID-19. I mean, we are focused like uh, as, as best as we can on that. And uh, so we want to keep our, our online retail business going because it's such an important part of our customers' lives at this point, especially now where they don't have other shopping options perhaps. And so uh, you know, we've done things like for our workers, we've implemented over 150 different process changes just to try to keep them as safe as possible while keeping keeping this going uh, for our customers. I mean, it's, it's just it's super important. Uh, we give them pr protective gear and all that kind of stuff, even pay hikes. Uh, but for our customers themselves, uh, one of the most remarkable things is how we've reoriented our supply chain such that it can focus now on essential items like household goods, medical supplies, and that sort of thing. And that reorienting a supply chain as large as Amazon's quickly is, is a hard thing to do, uh, but it was absolutely the right thing to do. And we also have been able to obtain certain kinds of medical supplies that we're only making available to hospitals and public uh, health institutions. And so there's a bunch of different, our website accounts, the, the things that we're working on, it feels like it's never enough. Course. And uh, we're just so happy to have some small role in, in helping. Cool, cool. Um, all right, so got that out of the way. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we want to make sure everybody's safe. And I guess even with, uh, you know, with COVID-19 now, there's also the whole COVID-19, post-COVID-19, post right? And, and, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how that so, sort of plays out. So uh, I'm sure a lot of folks are going to be looking to Amazon to sort of lead and, and that sort of effort of how to get back to normalcy in our in our life. Um, so, <clears throat> wanted to kind of kind of kind of shift gears here again. Um, you know, the Amazon innovations that that happened in the, in the last twenty years. Um, you know, Amazon.com, and then there was all these other things. I remember when they started. Uh, you know, uh, launched the Kindle, and then. AWS and people are like, wait, you sell books, what's going on? You know, well, it's books and then it started everything else. And there was the other things like the Kindle and Amazon phone and then Alexa and then Go and then, you know, Blue Origin and all that stuff. So like, I wanted to kind of ask about like how, um, so when innovation happens in the, in the company, like uh, how, how does it form? Like, you know, again, selling books to like now doing cloud, like, there's probably so many like hundreds, if not thousands of decisions that's happened in between. And, it, and, you know, I'm sure Amazon has to have to come up with some sort of framework or even do they embed something in their culture, right? Like kind of explain that, like how does innovation happen in Amazon from a very 50,000 foot view perspective? Yeah. Well, first of all, Brian, the, the company itself feels very much the same from the inside. And so, yeah, it was much smaller, both in scale and scope. Uh, when I joined, but at the same time, it feels very much the same because we do things the same way. Uh, we have a method of, of doing things, of making business decisions, of innovating, of grading ourselves, all, of, all those things. It's very uh, method-based. Um, for innovation, innovation is not something that you can do repeatedly by accident. Now, people will stumble upon new ideas or innovations every so often accidentally, but you can't possibly sustain those kinds of accidental inventions. You actually have to have a methodology for it. And so we have one. Um, it, we don't claim it's, you know, the, uh, the only one. Certainly other enterprises have ways of innovating. Um, and we don't even claim it's the best one. It just happens to be Amazon's way of doing it. And it's, it's served pretty well for our customers over all these years. Uh, and we've, we have had these innovations over the years. And they seem, from the outside, they seem surprising. Like, you know, I remember very well what you're talking about, that online bookseller doing what? Why would you do that? That sort of thing. Um, and yet it was all very focused on what we could be doing for our customers. We, we figure out a way to do something new for them 
Um, and that's the that's the drive behind our innovation. If you, we don't we don't just innovate for the sake of it. Uh, it's not kind of a, you know, general research. This is actually we're trying to get at very specific customer needs, even if the customers don't know they need it. So you mentioned the Kindle in 2007. No one was walking around saying, "Gee, I really wish the physical book would you know give way to an electronically held dedicated book reader." And no one was saying that. No one was clamoring for it, and yet we invented it, and uh, our customers like it a lot. Likewise, uh, in the mid 2000s, no one was saying, please, you know, you online books or Amazon, please go invent cloud computing. No one was saying that, but we had, we had an internal set of problems and needs that we, uh, we were trying to address internally. And we also recognized that other enterprises were having some of the same kinds of challenges where individual teams working on a very specific kind of a project, each would have its own database designer, each would have its own software development engineer, Design, doing nothing more than sort of the repetitive tasks of setting up a database or a, a, a storage facility or, a, uh, or you know, running hardware, um, things that are very repetitive. And so we figured out a way internally to harmonize things within Amazon to serve our core businesses. And we said, look, why don't we make this available to third parties? And that's actually a pattern at Amazon. I think you'll, you know, if, if you're wondering what we'll be doing in 15 years, I can't tell you. But I do know that we will be a customer obsessed company and we will have figured out ways to do things really well for an existing business and then made it available to third parties. So about the time I was joining the company, we started to allow sellers, uh, third party sellers to come onto our website and sell things right alongside our retail business. And uh, Wall Street hated this idea. I mean, they just they thought this is crazy. You're allowing competitors to come into your store in essence and sell right alongside you and take away sales. Well, we didn't view it that way. Wall Street hated it. We thought it was really good for our buyer customers because they'd have more selection, but we also got a new kind of customer called the seller customer. And so that was similarly, we, we developed a way to bring in developer customers with AWS uh, launched back in the mid 2000s. And so it's worked out very well for them, but it was, it seemed, it was such a natural outgrowth of things. And so I would, I would hope that 15 years from now, we're still not only innovating, but also doing things that if we figure out some, you know, how to do something well and we want to make it available as a service to third parties. No, we, no that, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, you, you do it very well internally and then because it's so good because, you know, Amazon has a sort of a culture of um, hiring the best minds, right? And they're not going to, they're not going to just, you know, be in their own little box. They're going to, they're going to try to be creative and then it's kind of oozes over. Right. So then ultimately, Hey, we got this, cool technology that we should probably give give to the world and still make a good money you know good penny out of that right pretty penny out of that so i really like that um uh i, I wanted to um it's very interesting i talked about like the the sort of the innovation seems like it's co it's coming it's coming out of like sort of the culture right the culture of amazon and i know that um amazon you know one of the things that that people always talk about culture is like well, hey, you know, we, we try, we, we have to set culture and we have to set the sort of the tone of it by kind of, and again, the, you know, putting up on the wall, right? Like our five principles. I know that Amazon has uh, 14 principles that they kind of abide by. And, I, and then I've, I've seen some of your past interviews where you have, you know, up, you know, of the 14, you have, you know, you have six of them that's kind of your favorite. But one of the things that I always keep on hearing from the Amazon um, mantra is customer obsession, right? And so there's like a meme of Jeff Bezos saying, figure out what the customer wants, be a, uh, obsessed with your customers and then work backwards, right? So kind of talk about like the, the whole culture, um, you know, mindset of Amazon and, and, and sort of how does that sort of, you know, uh, you know, how does that manifest itself from a day-to-day -day operation? Yeah, so it's a super important part of what it is to be at Amazon, what Amazon is. Uh, we have these leadership principles and to be clear, these these principles apply to everyone in the company. So whatever it is these days, 800, 900,000, however many we've got these days, uh, everybody is expected to abide by these principles. And again, it's not religion. It just happens to be the way we do things. Uh, and they guide decision-making at Amazon, you know, day-to-day decision-making, major plans decision-making, how we hire people, how we evaluate ourselves, all those things. Uh, but customer obsession is the most important of the 14 by far, so the, the first among equals. and um, if you're always focused on your customers, uh, you'll do a lot better for them and for your enterprise than if you are worried about competitors. Um, you know, 
there are enterprises that are competitor focused and they use for terms like fast following and that sort of thing. That's one way of doing business. It just simply isn't our way of doing it. We are aware of uh, competition, but we don't obsess over them. We obsess over our customers. How that manifests itself uh, in the context of innovation is what we call the working backwards process. And this is where we have an idea for a new product or service that we want to deliver to our customers sometime in the future. We'll actually today write out the press release describing that idea in, as a new product or service. We'll write the press release that announces it, knowing full well that press release won't go out for, for months and more likely for years. Uh, and then from that point, from that press release, we will work backwards to today, figuring out all the things that we need to invent, sort of that the how of getting it to uh, a customer, whereas the press release itself is describing the what, the what is in it for a customer. And so customers, you know, in any business, customers really don't care how a product or service gets to them. They only care how it affects their lives. Is it a good thing for them? Do they want it? And explain to me, you know, you know what's in it for me as a customer. Um, and then the, the figuring out how to do it is something that we will will take on. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, when we write out a press release like this, what we want to do is simply impossible today. We, we know that it cannot be done. And so we write the release anticipating that we're going to, working backwards from that, we're going to have to invent stuff that, that doesn't exist today. And so it's a very focused way of, uh, of innovating and inventing because we have a, a very set goal in mind. It's not like, uh, hey, let's go invent this cool you know, gadget. It's more like, what would a customer get out of this and how can we, how can we make it? Um, no, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I think um, uh, I've actually tried to do that myself, like try to uh, create a press release and it, it, it puts it into the perspective of a customer because like if you can't, when you read it and you don't get excited, it's like who else, I mean, who else is going to get excited, right? Like, so I, I felt like that it's, it's very aligned with sort of this customer obsession, you know, theorem that you guys have. There was, there was other things that you had talked about, um, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the 14 different principles, like uh, there's that two pizza team, there's that the six pager meeting, you know, PowerPoints have been banned. Uh, maybe, maybe can you talk about you know maybe some of that stuff because I think it could be very useful for uh, startups that are listening in, in on this uh, on this fireside chat. Yeah, so I've worked for a lot of large organizations. You mentioned Intel Corporation, uh, the Federal Communications Commission. I worked for NASA, uh, a lot of big organizations, but only one startup. And the startup, of course, was Amazon. And in those days, it felt like a startup. We had we wouldn't make up even a profitable quarter for several. Years, I think it was about two, two years or so before we had a profitable quarter after I joined. Um, and the, the, the point is this, that it still feels like a startup internally. And that's very deliberate. It has to be worked out. You can't just sort of assume that bureaucracy won't uh, creep in. You have to fight against it. And so we have different methods. You mentioned a few of them of ensuring that we still behave like a startup, despite being however many hundred thousand people we are these days. Um, and else, we're going to get to a point where it doesn't, it, it collapses. We, we really want to be able to maintain that startup mentality. Uh, the two pizza team you mentioned is one way of doing it. And this is where we, if we have a new idea for a product or service, the first team that addresses it is drawn from different parts of the company. You get expertise somewhere. Uh, and you kind of pull it together to address this, this opportunity or challenge. Um, and that the number of people brought together on the team should be comfortably fed with two extra large pizzas. And the reason it's defined that way, it's, it's not only kind of cute, but it's also because we don't want it to be a fixed number because, uh, a, you know, if you're, if you have a you know, set of seven or eight people who are working on something and you need an, an expert, um, like you need a, a machine learning expert and you know of a woman who's just come off a project, she's available, she's got the machine learning tools uh, and expertise, you want to invite her to the project, but if that's going to take it up over some artificial limit of number, then she can't join the project, and that's stupid. So we want her on the two pizza team, and there's enough flexibility to allow her to join. The, the reason why it's sort of capped at roughly two pizzas is because uh, behavioral science indicates that once the team gets to, say, about a dozen people, or maybe a few more, uh, it no longer functions as a single team. There are just too many nodes to communicate among, and it, it, the, the team necessarily fragments, defeating the purpose of a single team. So that's the two piece of rule you mentioned, the six pager. All of our decision making of any level of importance, of, you know, sort of above mid level uh, in the company, is accompanied by text narratives where we actually force the proponent of an idea to write out in narrative prose form the idea. 
and not to use bullet points because bullet points are, allow too much uh, imprecision, you know, too much flexibility, especially in, in the heat of the moment. Uh, I think we've all been in meetings where you know, someone has an idea and saying something and the boss misinterprets it and says that, that this misinterpreted you, this is the, what a great idea that is. And then they immediately have to go with what the boss wants as opposed to what was a good idea. Um, so that, the, the malleability of bullet points leads to that kind of bad decision-making. What, what we do instead is require this, this narrative. And at the beginning of a decision-making meeting, everybody just reads the document. So everybody has read the document, it's all fresh in their minds, and uh, then it's, it's ripe for decision-making. Well, wait, wait, because uh, you're, you're going really fast on that specific, there's something I wanted to kind of like dissect here, because I know that you sure. said every meeting, especially if it's important, you know, PowerPoints are banned, you know, you don't want to do bullet points, you want to get it as detailed as possible. Six pager meetings, like six page, like, so I'm just trying to think like, in the day of Amazon, hey, we'll have a meeting, it's kind of important. You have a six page uh, or something, like just a synopsis of what we're gonna talk about, but it's very detailed. You distribute, you, you distribute these papers, right, before the meeting, or is it like during the meeting? Like, how's that, how do you, how do you guys do this? It's, it sounds a little bit uh, pedestrian to talk in this level of detail, but you're absolutely right to focus on it, Brian, because it, it does matter. You know, we've, we've worked with this long enough to know that it, it works, at least at Amazon. So, you know, maybe it wouldn't necessarily work elsewhere, but it does work for us. Um, and the idea is that the narrative that I talked about that is produced in advance of a meeting that, uh, at which decisions are made can be no longer than six pages. It can be shorter than that, but it can only be six pages long. And the idea is six pages is something that can be read and digested in about a half an hour. So um, the idea is we'll schedule an hour long meeting to make a decision. The narrative will be distributed at the beginning of the meeting. It doesn't have to be in advance because you don't want some people to have read it in advance and other people not to. You want everybody to have the same amount of time, same focus right there in the moment. Everybody reads it. And everybody is, is ready to go and have make the decision in the second half hour of the meeting. And it does a lot for you. Not only uh, is it good for the uh, participants in the meeting to get all this information for them, but it also forces the proponent of an idea to, to articulate what she really means, what she's really proposing, and not to waffle or not to be unclear. Because when you're writing out prose, uh, you know, paragraphs, sentences, sections, those sorts of things, um, it forces you to be disciplined about your thinking as well as your writing. And so it, ultimately it helps everybody. It's, it's a little bit more uh, burdensome in advance to a proponent of an idea simply because you can't go in with sort of a slapdash, you know, PowerPoint, I don't mean to bust my man, a bullet point presentation. Um, but by having to have written this out in prose narrative, it, it does force thinking. Um, and so then the decisions are so much easier that way. When it actually comes time for the, the group assembled to make a decision, uh, it's it's much easier. It, it turns out to be very efficient. Mm -hmm. Now that that's it, it, it's it's it. I, I'm just trying to think how I can even implement this. You know, with our group, it's like, okay, guys, read this. It's going to be pure silence for the next thirty minutes, and then we're gonna we're gonna start deciding on things. <laughs> it just it just seems very. Uh, I mean, it's it's amazing that Amazon does that, but like. Uh, it, it's like, it's, it feels like it's so awkward, but it, I mean, you guys sort of perfected that technique and that's why you guys are, you know, you guys make decisions uh, and, and, and important ones. And which actually, which is to my next point, um, when you guys make a decision and it adversely hurts the customer, so it's like you, you made a decision, but then you found out, oh, that's a bad decision, right? Like, how do you guys handle that? Well, it, we hope to keep it extremely rare that that happens. We, look, we're a company that accepts failure. Uh, and I think that's a big part of our culture, that failure is not only okay, it's actually expected at some level. And the reason why is because we expect experimentation. To be innovative, you have to experiment. And if you're doing an experiment, it has to be able to fail. Otherwise, it's not an experiment. So failure is, is going to happen. Uh, we make, and Jeff personally takes credit for billions of dollars of failure. I'm sure he's right about that. And you know, we all have had our failures, but um, the failures that we really would prefer to have are experiments that didn't turn out the way we thought they would, but it never got out to a customer. And not because we're embarrassed about it. We'd be really clear, we're perfectly fine. I'm telling you about it. I'm telling you about all the failures that we've had over the years. We continue to fail. Uh, but the point is that 
those failures, for the most part, are ones that customers never had the burden of receiving. Um, the one big exam uh, exception to that, and the one that I get most frustrated about, is the, the Fire Phone. Uh, yeah. We launched a, a phone product back in, uh, I guess, 2014, and it, uh, we thought it was kind of cool. It had some really unique features in it, and our, our customers just didn't like it. It, wasn't, it didn't live up to their expectations, and the thing uh, was a flop. I think we discontinued selling it after, I want to say, it was about eight months. Um, and we took a like $170 million write down on it. So it wasn't a financial success, but the money didn't matter. I mean, it's $170 million, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's still, that wasn't what hurt. What hurt is our customers trusted us to buy this thing and then it didn't live up to their expectations. That's, that's the kind of failure that hurts the most. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, you know, we're, we're okay with failure. We just really don't want it getting out to customers. Yeah, I think one of the principles, uh, the 12 principles was uh, make reversible decisions fast. Uh, and so uh, I think that was a good example of that. And obviously $175 million write down is, is a costly one, but like it's it's something that you still learn. It, do you think that you might, Amazon may, may still uh, want to take another stab at that with, with a phone? <laughs> As with other, other, other uh, you know, the Googles and Facebook, they have, they, they've been trying to do that too. You know, I don't know. I mean, you never say never, but uh, the teams that worked on the Fire Phone eventually went and were working on our Echo products. And so, I mean, there, there were, a lot came out of that, a lot of positive learnings. But again, it should never have gotten out to customers in the way that it did. And that's, that's frustrating. Um, and so for the most part, we can experiment with things without the risk or a significant risk anyway of adversely uh, affecting customers. Um, one that uh, worked out very well that we had to experiment with customers because we, we really couldn't prove it to ourselves that it was a, a sustainable feature was Amazon Prime. Uh, this is a, began as a, a subscription service that allowed, uh, that, that provided uh, free two-day shipping on millions of items. That's where it started. And obviously, Amazon Prime has a much uh, broader selection of benefits to customers now. But we really didn't have a way of proving to ourselves that that service was going to be sustainable. And so we launched it anyway. And um, the losses incurred in the early years on Prime were just astronomical. And, this was, and this, these weren't losses associated with buying uh, you know, a warehouse and then it doesn't work out and you have to sell it for pennies on a dollar. This was just money that was going straight out the door to the shippers. Mm -hmm. And so that, these losses were you know, uh, potentially not sustainable. Now, it turns out our customers love Prime so much that it, it works and it, it's the kind of thing that we continually add benefits to. But, we really didn't know. And so that's another example of an experiment that really kind of had to go out to customers. Uh, and I'm happy to say that one worked out for them. No, that, that's interesting guys. Uh, I remember um, maybe 15 years ago, uh, Jeff Bezos invested into this uh, company that was doing exactly that. It was called Cosmos. <laughs> and the way he pitched it was like, hey, it's Amazon in one hour, right? <laughs> and so it's kind of funny how it's just kind of made a full sort of circle. Uh, you know, it may be, may have been a good idea. Uh, you know, the idea might have been good, but the execution, you know, with logistics and things like that, it took that many years to figure that out in order to make it efficient to make it now a viable business. So um, it's really it's really amazing how Amazon was able to pull that off. And I think maybe sort of that bet, the initial bet where they learn, like you said, you know, embrace failure because you're going to learn from that to make a better uh, product later. And I think Amazon Prime was is a good good example of that. Um, wanted to talk about uh, the other products. So like, you know, you know, Alexa, Echo, uh, there's a lot of folks here that are in the AI uh, machine learning space. Um, what sort of like, you know, my, so this is my big question. So this is what I like, because I, because I can ask, I can ask you any questions, right? <laughs> these, these questions I've had in the back of my head. Um, Alexa, is Alexa going to eventually turn into a robot? <laughs> you know, kind of like we see with Jetson, like, the actual robot and then you know there's it's going to sort of have a humanoid form or is it still going to be like this thing that we see like a speaker like what, what's kind of like you what, what are you guys thinking about about that like Alexa and AI in the future well so I had to reach over here and mute my uh, echo device because uh, she was responding every time you said her name <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this this happens more often than you might have I think but so um Look, I, I don't know exactly the trajectory of uh, Alexa-enabled devices. I know that the service 
is a layer that can fit into many different kinds of products, uh, physical products. And so the Echo line of devices is one that we have focused on at Amazon, but now we have smart home devices that also ride on top of the, the Alexa um, uh, service. And so uh, recall, of course, that there are a bunch of different layers. I don't want to confuse them with the, the, the stack, but uh, Alexa runs on AWS. And so now AWS makes a lot of the tools that Alexa relies on available to third parties to play with as well. So uh, natural language recognition, for example, that is, is hard. It's really hard to get an understanding what people mean when they say something. Um, it used to be the case that the, the early forms of uh, uh, you know, language recognition were simply taking words and converting them into uh, to text and then throwing them into some sort of a text processor or a, uh, let's say, a, an internet search. But what we're trying to get at is what, it, what does the speaker actually mean when she says something? Uh, and I mean Alexa, I mean a, a human, what, she, what that person means. And so if, I, you know, if I'd like to have you, I don't know, uh, move the, uh, the poster that's behind you, there are probably 30 different ways I could, could convey that to you. And you would understand every one of those 30 ways. But it's very hard for a machine to know that that's what I just, that's the simple request I had was for you to move the poster. Um, and so we spend a lot of effort trying to get at natural language recognition. And, and that is one of the ways that we use machine learning. Now, you know, artificial intelligence has been part of Amazon for a long time. In fact, it predates me. Um, the, the recommendation engine that made uh, Amazon's retail business really take off was a, a, an early form of artificial intelligence where it was actually something called uh, collaborative filtering. And the whole idea is that over a large data set, you can look at what customers purchase and you can guess pretty well what other things they might want to purchase. And so it's a, it's a complicated um, machine learning problem, but it actually is, has a, just a super practical application. And that's, you know, the recommendation engine runs on that. Uh, so we've been doing, you know, AI and ML a long time, but now it's, it's particularly gratifying to make these tools available to third parties in a way that just simply were not possible uh, 25 years ago. You know, if you wanted to do AI 25 years ago, you probably had to buy a Cray or, you know, go to a university that had one of supercomputers. And now you don't. You just use a service like SageMaker. Um, and it's simple enough that I know how to use it. I've used it with a, a project with one of my boys. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of cool that to have to harness the power of machine learning and essentially infinite compute uh, and to be able to apply it to whatever, you know, particular problem you've got. And I, just one last thing, it feels like the, it was sort of in this golden age of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence where now the tools are suddenly available to everyone. You don't have to go out and buy a supercomputer and lease the software and pay somebody to run it. You just use these simple online tools. And uh, to avail, you know, to, to focus on what's differentiating about what you do in your life, whether it's a personal life or a business life kind of a thing or a community service sort of things, you can now focus on that and then use these tools to make what you do even better. Well, that, that, that's really amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean look, we can go on like, I mean, seriously for days on Alexa, because that's, that's kind of like what the, the, the future is. And you know, I've been looking at some of the, the innovation that's happening in Japan with robotics and, I feel like, uh, you know, the, the mechanical part of it is, uh, you know, they're, they're still, still trying to figure that out. But then, you know, the, the brains behind it, uh, that's the important part. So Alexa and the Googles of the world, that's going to become more important, especially when, um, you know, our society uh, becomes um, less, I guess, I don't know, social, but then more dependent on, on computers where you can't tell the difference, the Turing, the Turing test, right? You can't tell if it's a human or, or, or a machine. And it, it's going to be interesting to see, like, how these sort of uh, digital companion, like these Alexas of the world become digital companions and that you can actually carry a, a pretty good conversation, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's more like, you know, um, yes, it's, it's like we do want to interact with humans, but then, you know, we'll have like the, these, these sort of like these artificial intelligence that have become our companions and it'd be interesting to see how that kind of plays out society wise. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to, to, uh, before we open up the Q&A, there's a, there's a few other topics I want to go through really quick. Um, I, I, I see that Amazon with the, the store Amazon Go 
Um, I saw a, a recent article about now Amazon selling their sort of package to um, sort of the grocery stores, right? So, you know, you go in there, it's completely like um, clerkless. You don't have to interact with a cashier. Uh, you go in, you go out. But, but you know, now could a, you know, um, the world's largest grocery store sort of, you know, plug and play with that sort of system? Like, is that, is, you know, are you guys thinking in that sort of direction of sort of taking over the, 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 the food, <laughs> the food industry that way, it's running basically essentially your software? Yeah, I think it's another example of where we figured out how to do something hard and for an existing internal use and then made the service available to third parties. And so, uh, you know, our warehouses are open to third parties who could take advantage of the logistics uh, skills that we've built up over the years. Our website is available to sellers. Our, you know, our you know, book publishing is available to authors of, you know, of every stripe, not having to go through rural publishers. I mean, it's just an example of making um, an expertise available to third parties. And so I, I don't think it should be surprising to anyone now. As far as, you know, reaching all the different possible use cases out there, they're very hard. I mean, you know, if you've ever been to an Amazon Go store, I encourage you to, to go at some point. It's, um, it's what it does, in essence, is get rid of a thousands of years old bad customer experience where you walk into a store. And we're all used to this. I mean, this is, this is how we do things day to day. We go into a store, we find the stuff that we want to buy, and then we have to wait in the queue to pay money to get the stuff. Uh, and that's just a, a, a lousy customer experience, but it's been with us for so long, we've kind of been lulled into accepting it. What Amazon Go does is it just gets rid of that experience where you don't have to wait in the queue, you don't have to check out, you don't have to pay anybody money, you just walk out with whatever you, what you, what you wanna buy. And so it's, it's more the case that it, since it is a, a, such an improved uh, customer experience that I think other uh, retailers will want to avail themselves of this technology and then focus on what they do best, which is stocking their particular things that they want to sell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so this, this is, this is really interesting. I mean, we're talking about all these innovation and, and I'm assuming all these innovation, sort of these, you know, I don't want to call it labs, but innovation labs that you would have at Amazon. Is there an, an intent to sort of move some of the, those innovations that you guys are doing um, in Seattle to bring it here to DC because I'm just getting my, my my chat my chat's blowing up of like hey how can we engage with Amazon right like you know if, if, if there's a if there is a uh, if there's something similar to like Capital One Labs so Capital One Labs was sort of um, uh, it was a lab that they had which was um, an R and D uh, branch for for Capital One but then they would some they would like interface sometimes with the, the lo, uh, with startups. To, to get some sort of ideas and stuff. Uh, they'll do like outreach program and uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell them like, Hey, this is kind of stuff we're doing, but also let us know what you're doing as well. Right. Uh, so there's sort of this good collaborative um, sort of uh, form forum that they had. Do you think Amazon is thinking about doing something like that? Or, you know, what is that, what is that going to look like? Right. Your internal R and D and are you going to have a sort of like a external R and D that's kind of like outreach to the startup community? Well, let me, yeah, let me, let me take that on, Brian. I think one of the first things to recognize is that there isn't just a central skunk works at Amazon where all the innovations come out of, they, you know, sort of hidden away somewhere, and that's where innovation is done. Every single one of us in the company is expected to be innovative. Every single one. I mean, there's, there's no exceptions, and that, that includes the folks who are working in warehouses or, or the, they're on the, the delivery side of things. Those, those teams typically practice what are called Kaizans, maybe if you remember the Kaizan, but this is a, a, a technique developed by Toyota in the mid 80s. And basically the idea was that uh, small improvements or imitations introduced into a, in an operation can have dramatic effects. Well, at scale at Amazon, if we can figure out ways to speed up a package in, in, our, in our warehouse, just even by a second or two, that has an enormous impact uh, you know, multiplied over billions of packages a year. And so everybody in the company is expected to innovate. So there's not like one lab, it's, it's the first point. Second is, yes, we want to work with startups. We, we've had this history. We were a startup after all, uh, not long ago, but it's also the case that we, we wanted a community in which we could operate. And that was one of the attractions of Northern Virginia in the DC area was the, the vibrancy of the startup community here. Mm -hmm. You need only look at some of the groups like the Northern Virginia Technical Technology Council, 
And there's a group that has as its members large enterprises, uh, medium SMEs, and also startups. And so we know this ecosystem exists already. We're, we hope to be additive to that ecosystem. We'll be part of it. And you see things like uh, Virginia Tech dedicating a lot of money to build out uh, more educational institutions or facilities up in Northern Virginia as a result of the HQ2. Well, that's, that's gratifying for sure. But we, we're uh, entering an existing ecosystem and we want to add to it. And, you know, as, as you know, there are network effects in an ecosystem. And this, and this is world class. I mean, you, this, is, this is not just sort of local boosterism. It's, it is true that this community in the D.C. area has a world class tech community that is, you know, uh, second to few, if any, uh, around the world. And so um, coming here, it, it, you know, Amazon is joining an existing ecosystem, uh, not creating one out of whole cloth. And if you're looking for a, you know, sort of starting point to engage, uh, I, you know, I, I, you could do worse than trying out AWS Activate. I mean, that really is a, a really good place to start, uh, you know, getting into the, the scene uh, of Amazon, but also uh, building up connections here in the community even more than you already have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and again, I think that that's that's kind of like what the reason why we're doing this, right? Like the the mentor month having AWS, um, and that's kind of like an outreach program right there. Um, and it'd be interesting if there are, if there are the local teams, right? So if there's AWS Activate and then their their team, the hub, you know, their I don't call it headquarters, but their their main team is here in Northern Virginia. That's going to be very helpful for groups like us because. You know, we can always invite them to fireside chats and DC, you know, DC tech meetups like this, right? To talk about the kind of things that Amazon's doing, AWS is doing. Um, and I know that there's, uh, there is big presence here already with Amazon, uh, AWS, right? Uh, you know, the AWS Federal, right? The headquarters here, right? The, the, the president's out here. Um, and she grew that, you know, literally, I don't know, a couple, um, what, 15 years ago, I guess. Um, and now it's like, a big chunk of your revenue, right? Uh, which is right in Herndon, um, AWS Educate. You know that's uh, right. They, they, the the that folks is the education part of it, but then they're based out here in Herndon. Uh, the data centers, right? Like uh, so, government government. So there 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 there's a lot of like uh, exposure you guys already have, and then HQ two kind of sort of now that's that's the big mothership, the other the other side of the mothership. So. Um, I, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see how we could, again, startups could engage with, with Amazon and, and what you're saying is there's, there's ways to do it. And, and obviously there's probably going to be programs that's going to happen, um, you know, yet to be seen. Right. Um, I know that the, uh, uh, and I'm just looking through here, like, cause I know that you guys have, you know, more specifically, I'm, I'm just trying to use very, very, uh, you know, examples like, so your prime, your first prime air delivery, right. I know that um, um, uh, Virginia Tech, they have this, um, they, they, they have a research where they can now, you can do your drone flights. I'm just kind of curious, are you guys kind of tapping into those sort of resources with the local universities and, and such like, uh, uh, things like that? Yeah, so obviously we're a global company. And yeah. so we, we have different operations all around the world. Um, and we've managed to do things like uh, the Prime Air, this is the future drone delivery service. Uh, we've set up testing operations in different parts around the world, and, and uh, I've spent a fair amount of time, for example, in Cambridge, uh, in England, where uh, we have a large testing facility there for Amazon Prime Air, and so uh, we're, we're handling this globally. One of the cool things about, I mentioned the Kaizen process at Amazon, one of the cool things is if you uh, develop something for customers that works really well for them in one place, uh, it doesn't stay local to that place. It can be deployed globally uh, throughout our network of operations. And so, um, yes, we're going to have great relationships. I, I'm confident that we'll grow over time with the, the local educational community. And I think we have, what, the 11 uh, sort of institutions of higher learning right in the area. And so it's a, it, it's a, it's a fertile place to, to land a second headquarters. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that just because of the headquarters, that's the only reason why you would want to reach out Indicate with Amazon. I think the, the, the first thing I would do as a startup is to really focus on what differentiates what your product or service does. And so make it great. Don't, you know, the, the, the other stuff will follow on, the, the partnerships, the relationships, that stuff will follow on. But having the, having the customer focused product or service and doing it really well is that's, that's ultimately the, 
you know, what uh, an enterprise like Amazon would look at is to say, well, how are they serving their customers? I look back at um, when, uh, when we acquired Zappos uh, back in uh, 2009 timeframe. Uh, and so basically what Jeff saw in Tony was a guy who was absolutely, you know, focused, absolutely focused on customers in a way that just resonated so greatly with Jeff. So we, we acquire Zappos and now Zappos is part of the Amazon family, but it really is operated more or less independently by Tony. And so um, that sort of a model is available too, that things don't just have to be subsumed um, into the company. And, and but, but my point is this, if what was attractive was not what's, you know, what Tony called up Jeff and said, you know, this is what I want to do is more like, Tony was doing a great job serving customers, and Jeff recognized it and said, "This is we're, we're meant to work together." Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, this is great. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, open this into Q and A. So, um, if anybody has some questions, I know we have some questions here already. Uh, please do put it in there, and if, uh, and if you do this, please make sure that you put your name in there so I'll know who you are. <laughs> Because uh, you know, there's some anonymous attendees here. I don't know where the question's coming from. So uh, let me let me see if there's a question that you can answer here. So um, uh, let's see. Science is trying to support computing part. Um, okay. So uh, the. Um, so there is, here's a, here's a general question, I guess, uh, from Elaine, how do you deal with deadlines at Amazon in context of innovation? How do you decide on one? So if somebody says, Hey, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, you know, somebody says, Hey, we're gonna, this is our deadline. Here's a timeline. You know, do you, do you, do you try to like, uh, follow that? And then, you know, do our people, or is it a, could it be a moving target, I guess? I don't know. Deadlines are very important, I guess, right? And well, if you, yeah. Yeah, they're probably less important than you might think. Uh, what we're trying to do is accomplish what we set out to do in that press release. And so what would be worse is to cut corners and say, well, that's, you know, that thing in the press release, that was too hard. Let's not do that. We'll do something else instead. Then at that point, you really don't have a, a firm goal. So that the timing is less important. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting it right and, and really doing a, a great service to customers. Um, I think part of the reason why this process of innovation works at Amazon, where, where failure is okay if you're, if you're experimenting, is because we do it all the time. It's not the kind of thing that we just pick up one day and say, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is our thing, we're going to work on all of, you know, we're going to put all of our interest into one thing and let's hope it works because if it doesn't, then it's a bad thing. We've lost a lot of money and time. No, it's, it's more like we're, since we're doing this all the time, many of the things that we're trying will fail. But all we have to do is every so often get one that does succeed, um, and th that will pay for a lot of the failures. And so the way Jeff describes it, he's, he analogizes it to sports. If you have a, a professional team playing a, you know, a, a bunch of children, the professional team will win no matter what game they're playing. They will win. But what do they get out of it? They get exactly one win. That's it. So the, the score could be, you know, very lopsided. But if, uh, if that is the game is played, you only get one win. That's not how it is in business or innovation. So you can have innovations that not only get one win, but they get 10 or 10,000 or 100,000. It's just, the, there's really no upper cap on success is the point. And so uh, we don't worry so much about deadlines simply because we are always doing this, always trying, always innovating. And that's, that's, that's something that it gets a little hard to get used to it, it, in some levels, simply because it involves so much failure along the way. So many of these projects are gonna fail. Um, but because it's so clearly accepted by the company, by the CEO, then, then it's okay. Then we do this all the time and, and it's, it's less important to, to meet a particular deadline than it is to make sure that the product or service getting out to customers is, is great and they love it. Okay, got it, got it. Um, as, uh, Sachin, uh, had asked, um, you know, Amazon, you guys are doing the, uh, the drone delivery. Um, how are you guys, uh, utilizing that for COVID-19? <laughs> well, yeah, it's interesting. I saw the FAA had a bulletin out today saying that they will allow some flights based on this kind of a need, 
um, but only within the, the context of existing authorizations. Um, look, we're, you know, we're looking to make this delivery service uh, a reality very broadly, and we're just not there yet. It's just not operational at the level that would be useful to customers. You can certainly imagine how this would be a, a great thing to have going, uh, you know, broadly deployed uh, to, to meet this kind of a challenge. But uh, uh, it's we're really heads down focused on figuring out how to, to get this uh, service up and running in a way that is uh, safe, but also great for customers. And, you know, it, it turns out it's really hard. I mean, we knew that this was going to be challenging, but the, uh, the, the challenges, the technical challenges that we have uh, in the primary service, uh, this, this future drone delivery service are, you know, are tough ones, uh, but we're taking them on. And uh, I was part of the team that actually drafted that press release uh, for Amazon Prime. There was about five or six of us who drafted this uh, years ago. And um, the, the focus of the press release was, was very simple. It was delivery to a customer within 30 minutes of an order. You know, we didn't talk about propeller design and battery life and navigation, and, you know, uh, radio hardening and machine learning. They didn't have all that in there. It was really delivery to a customer within 30 minutes in order. And that's the focus. So that's where we want to get to, and we're still working on it. Okay, great. Um, next question, um, Beth, uh, Beth Jacobs, good, good friend, uh, how's it going? Um, as head of global innovation policy, uh, what are your top priorities right now? Top three. Top three. Um, well, the top priority is to do our best to ensure that we continue to have the focus that we've had for my 20 years at Amazon, which is this customer obsession. I, I, when the, as the company is growing so quickly and in terms of number of, uh, you know, of my colleagues, um, I, I want to ensure that internally we maintain the same methods of innovating that we've had in place for all this time. And this, it takes work. You, you know, culture doesn't just maintain itself. It actually takes work. And so one of my uh, focuses is to, to talk as much as possible to internal audiences, especially newer employees, about the importance of, of really, you know, living these leadership principles. They're, they're not, as you say, just, you know, taped to the wall. Uh, they are, they're very real and, uh, it's, it's helpful for them to see someone who's been around as long as I to, to say that, you know, we, we do mean this and this is how this happened. And, you know, Amazon Prime launched because of this and, you know, we had a Kindle because of that and AWS grew up because of this. So um, I, that's, that's my principal focus. I, I really feel like as, as long as Amazon maintains its focus on customers and behaves as a day one company, you know, not resting on our laurels, not looking back, always looking forward, um, you know, we'll, we'll be around for a while and, and serving customers and hoping you know, we'll be delighting them for many years to come. Okay. Well, uh, do you, you, we have time for one more question? Paul? Oh, no, no I'm, I'm good. I wasn't I, sure you had to go anywhere, you know. And I was, yeah, right, <laughs> no, I can't, I can't say I'm heading for a plane like I usually <laughs> Yeah, we try to keep this uh, within one hour, so that's, that's why, because uh, we, 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 we post this back in our, uh, our uh, podcast, so, because uh, after one hour, people get real bored. So, um, I guess one last question. I think um, this is, this is kind of pertinent because, um, just because we're here in D.C., um, uh, CT has said thoughts on innovation government. Uh, you know, <laughs> are you guys innovation doing inside of governments? You mean? Yeah. So Amazon, are they doing? Uh, so I mean, obviously AWS Federal, right? That's that's a that's a great example of um, of, uh, of innovation in the government. But is, is there anything specific? Like, um, I, I and actually, this was going to be a question that I didn't ask, but like. You know, I know that the government, um, especially in this area, I mean, DARPA is li literally right down the road, right? And DARPA is very big on AI, right? And so they, they said they're going to be committing $2 billion into that. You know, is there something similar to that with, with, with Amazon where they're like, hey, we're going to really going to, we're going to, we're going to push in a lot of resources and money into this area while also leveraging what we have locally here, which happens to be the federal government. Yeah, well, so as you mentioned, uh, early in our conversation. And, um, Amazon Web Services public sector business has been headquartered here for a very long time. And so we have many public sector businesses, uh, the, you know, public sector uh, agencies that rely on the AWS business for their cloud computing needs. And so 
yeah, we are helping and uh, we're really excited to be able to serve those customers. They have, uh, you know, you don't need many examples today to recognize what important mission public sector agencies have. And so to be able to support them uh, with the cloud business, but with other businesses too uh, in Amazon is, uh, is really gratifying. And of course, that's a big part of being uh, in this region. Um, but it's, you know, they're, they're a, a form of customers and we want to obsess over them and, and serve their needs. And um, we, we think we're doing a pretty good job, but, you know, always room for improvement and we want to, uh, to make them as happy as we make our other customer sets. If I could leave you with one thing as, you know, entrepreneurs, startups that, that, that you are uh, on this call is uh, just a bit of advice, something that I learned uh, very early in my career. Actually, well, let me ask you the question because you're about to answer the question. <laughs> what's, what's the best piece of advice <laughs> you would given yourself 20 years ago? Oh, let's, let's do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I did it anyway, even without being advised by someone. Uh, and it wasn't because I was smart, it was just because of sort of my nature, uh, that time of my life, whatever. Uh, but it's, it's really important not to be afraid to learn. And um, this is something that you have to practice throughout your entire life, but it's also, once you do it, then you can have the confidence to do it repeatedly. But um, there are so many people that come across uh, challenge, a problem, uh, an issue, and especially if it feels like it's outside their area of expertise, they will just push it off and say, oh, I can't do that. Uh, one local example might be a, a, a law, a proposed, you know, a piece of legislation, and a bunch of engineers perhaps on the phone might think, well, I, I'm not a lawyer, I, I can't possibly do legislation. Yes, you can. Absolutely you can. And if it affects your business, if you're trying to serve the government, for example, one way or another, and there's a regulation that exists, don't rely on the lawyers to always explain it. So you just read it, try to understand it. And I'm telling there are so many things that are important to be understood that can be understood in just a weekend's worth of work. And so uh, the, the problem is, is that, they have, that so many people have a hard time getting past the fear of not understanding. And so just I'll, I'll close out with this. I was given a whole lot of responsibility very early in my career simply because I was unafraid to learn. There were so many, there were, I was surrounded by lawyers who thought that anything technical had to be done by engineers. They can't possibly understand it. That simply wasn't true. And I was also surrounded by engineers who were, who were saying, I can't possibly understand policy and legislation and law. Uh, and that's also not true. And so it just being willing to try to learn something is, is, uh, is a gift and it's a tool that will serve you throughout your life. I have one last question now. Okay, it's, go for it, because <laughs> because uh, uh, a lot of we've done hundred speakers and we always end it with this question. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be the service if I didn't ask it. Um, you ready? I'm ready. Who's your favorite superhero or historical figure and why? Yeah. So um, I've never been much into the the Marvel world and that, so I don't have that. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Alexander Hamilton. And, uh, you know, I, I still haven't seen the hip hop play or anything like that, just simply because I, I know enough about him that anything that is represented in a play, I'm sure we'll get, we'll get things wrong. But I, the, the Hamiltonian vision for how uh, a society that collaborates with, it, uh, with itself and has expertise and experts uh, is something that I really strongly believe in. And so much of the, the awful political discourse of today is based on uh, uh, a lack of respect for expertise. And so uh, the reason society works for humans is we do specialize and we ought, to ex ex uh, we ought to respect everyone else's expertise and they ought to respect ours. And so uh, Alexander Hamilton, the Hamiltonian vision and uh, the, uh, the notion of specialization and expertise. Awesome. <laughs> well, that said, thank you so much for your time, Paul. Uh, and we're very, very honored to have you here, and uh, hopefully we're going to hear a lot, a lot more from you um, as uh, Amazon um, extend their presence here in the area. Um, and love to have you come back uh, in our, um, our summer bash, and so then people can actually really meet you in person and see how like really cool and swell guy you are. So thank you for, for coming out to our uh, fireside chat. Brian, thanks for having me. I look forward to the party. Okay, great. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.